prayer. What a daunting task. Do you find yourself exhausted after your weekly prayer? Are you a bit rusty on your 15th century English? Love thy benevolence. That's, that's not right. That's where we come in. Easy Prayer is a service that scripture prayer for you. Just fill in the blanks to add a personal flair and prepare to impress the old boss man. Our customers have seen an 85% increase in getting what they want using our patented prayer process. Our staff is carefully trained and deeply attuned to the grammar and syntax of the spiritual realm. Oh, great vending machine, letteth thy mercies raineth upon me like April showers. And for an additional fee, we'll even pray in your stead. Easy prayer. Because we don't want God to waste our time. Uh, no, wait, I got that backwards. Because we don't want to waste God's time. I hope you understand that's tongue in cheek. <laughs> About 10 or so years ago, I was invited to Pastor Howie's round table, our founding pastor, where he invited friends throughout the West to come spend a week in Carmel and encourage each other, hear from God and have a mentor come in and guide him. And he asked me to cook the opening meal. So I did that. And it was at the grill, of course. And all the pastors are over here having a great old time. And one pastor kind of slid over and he goes, so what you doing? So while I'm barbecuing, he goes, well, why are you doing it like that? I said, well, it's going to taste good. He goes, it smells great. So who are you? And he just kept asking me questions. And I really, I thought, I really like this guy. Well, through that friendship with Pastor Howie, then also I got to know him. We have installed uh, this man in our church as an annual occurrence. And it just is so delightful for us. He was uh, the uh, senior pastor at Scottsdale Bible Church for over 20 years. And now for 17 years, he's been the president of Phoenix Seminary. And every year he comes and he just delights us, but he gives us great teaching that we can take home and make part of our lives. Please welcome Dr. Daryl Delisay. Thank you, Dennis. Well, good morning. I understand you are in a series on uh, practical barriers of faith. So let's get to it. I uh, um, came to Christ in 1966, and I don't know, maybe it's because I'm Cajun French, but my life has always been more of a dance before the Lord. And when I came to Christ, it's kind of a spiritual rhythm. And my spiritual rhythm is how I actually live out in a practical way my relationship to Jesus Christ and to honor my, my Heavenly Father. And, 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 and for me, it begins, my spiritual rhythm begins with this constant, constant conversation with God. It's just a constant engagement in my life. I'm consciously aware of his presence. And, and some people call it prayer. And people have redefined from the scriptures, uh, away from the scriptures, what prayer is really all about. And then they kind of define it their particular way. And then it doesn't work their particular way. It becomes a real barrier to their faith. You see, the issue is unanswered prayer. There are people who walked away from God because God has not answered their prayer. And for us, we don't want to talk about it because it's like a, a, a slow-moving acid to our faith. How many of you have ever had an unanswered prayer? <laughs> Hello. More than 10. Yeah, so we keep on going. And, you know, you don't want to say, well, you know, apparently prayer doesn't work because then that makes it sound like you're not spiritual enough. you got to have greater, you know, faith so that your prayers will work. So it's like a spiritual muscle. And we just get haywired on this whole issue of, of prayer because we redefine it. I, I've never read anybody who says, you know, I actually do pray enough. None of us think we pray enough. And the reason we don't think we pray enough is because down deep, we're sometimes not sure it really works. Every relationship, every relationship is based on two pillars, the pillars of trust and respect. You, you, you trust somebody, they'll do what they say. You, you respect somebody, they say who they are, you believe that they are who they claim to be. And without respect, without trust, there is no relationship. So it is, we trust God that God says he answers prayer, and so God should keep his promise, and he doesn't. Uh, we, God says that he's a loving, merciful, caring God, he has a whole lot of pain going on, and I'm praying, and, and he doesn't seem to do anything about it. So where's the trust? Where's the respect? Where's the relationship? 
It becomes more than a barrier to your faith. It becomes an acid destroying your faith unless we can put some biblical handles on what prayer is all about. People want to pray. People want to believe in prayer. Do you remember some years ago, Chicago Bears, when they were kind of at the height? And remember William Perry? William Perry was that real big lineman they used like a halfback running in. They called him the fridge. So big. Well, apparently the chaplain to the, that particular year, that particular team, uh, before a game, had asked the, 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 the players, uh, who knows the Lord's Prayer? William Perry puts his hand up. Well, well, Jim McMahon, the famed quarterback at the time, jumps up and says, I'll give 20 bucks if Perry knows the Lord's Prayer. Well, the, the, the chaplain said, go ahead, William. So William stands up sheepishly and he, he begins. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Smiled, sat down. McMahon pops right up, walks over to him, gives him the 20 bucks and said, how did I know he knew the Lord's prayer? See, people want to pray and they want to think they know how to pray. But prayer itself doesn't seem to always make sense. I mean, think it through with me. What do you say to somebody who knows everything? I am read in the scriptures, I've been told that God is all wise. So in my prayer, what bright idea am I going to come up with to make him smarter? I, I, I read that God is all good, all loving. So what am I going to ask him for that's going to make him better? If he's all wise, he's all good, all the good things, all the wise things ought to be happening anyway. So why should I say anything at all and screw it all up? So this whole concept of prayer just doesn't seem to make sense. And yet, God makes an issue of it. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, God basically ties it to the very will of God that is himself. He, he, he says this in verse 16. I've had people say, you know, where in the Bible does it tell you what his will is? I mean, where it simply says something is the will of God, so I can do it and know I'm doing the will of God. Well, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Rejoice always. Pray continually, that is without ceasing. The word is to have a cough, that, that you just kind of, <laughs> you just keep on praying. He says, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I mean, there, there, there's the deal. He just simply says, you want to know the will of God? Let's start with this. God wants you to talk to him. God wants a conversation, and God calls it prayer. So it's a big deal with God. He ties it to his will. And yet, I don't always have this thing figured out. So I don't know, should I pray or not? It's a barrier to the faith. So I want to share with you this morning, just quickly, in my 45 years of studying the scriptures, four things that I understand about biblical prayer as God defines it. And the first one is that it's commanded. It's commanded. Where? We just read it. This is an imperative. He says, this is the will of God that you rejoice always and you pray without ceasing. Continue to pray. Now, it's an imperative. It's a command. You say, but why would I obey something I don't fully understand? Have you noticed that we basically live life forward and we understand things backwards? I mean, we, 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 we do all kinds of stuff and we got to make a choice. Am I going to do it or am I going to wait till I understand? Because sometimes it's not until I do it that I turn around and go, Oy vey, now I understand. <laughs> See, I, I, uh, I, Scott, I actually pastored Scott's Bible Church for 25 years. And, and I remember we, we took a year and a half and uh, taught the book of Job verse by verse. <laughs> Some of them are still angry at me, but well, that's, hey, that's the book of Job. And some people think the book of Job is basically why innocent people suffer. That's not what the book is about. Never even answers that question at all. The book of Job is basically God has sovereign wisdom trying to be understood by puny little minds. And you try to take infinite wisdom and stuff it into a little brain. There's going to be some spillage. And this spillage is called mystery. The point is, I better not have made up my mind that before I obey something, I have to fully understand it. Because if you've got to fully understand an infinite mind with a little pea brain we've got then we're never going to obey anything and thus we'll never understand anything. And so the first thing I've learned about prayer from the scripture 
is that it is commanded. Whether there's things about it I understand, I don't understand, I'll pray because God commands me. He wants me to have a conversation with him. And he wants this conversation to be consistent. So first of all, I understand prayer is commanded. I don't wait to understand it. I just obey. Then at obeying, times I'll begin to understand. The second thing I learned is it's not magical. It's not magical. There's an interesting Proverbs. Proverbs 15, verse 8, where, where, where Solomon basically says, you know, the, 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 the prayer, the sacrifice, the prayer of the wicked is obnoxious to God, an abomination to God. But, but the prayer of the righteous, the one who thinks straight, it's a delight to him. It's, it, it, it takes great pleasure. Now, it's interesting. I'm glad he takes pleasure in the prayer of, of, of the righteous, the one who sees straight. But what's hit me is this phrase that Solomon uses in Proverbs that is an abomination. It's obnoxious to God, the prayer of the wicked. Now, that word, word wicked, the Hebrew word there in Proverbs actually means disjointed limbs, broken arm, broken but, but, but our, our word wicked comes from the Anglo-Saxon term wicca, which is the term for witch. Basically, he's talking about the witch's prayer. Because, see, the witch's prayer is all about magic. If you've ever looked up the word magic, all the word magic means is to manipulate spiritual powers to carry out your own will. All right? Kind of like the Lord's prayer has changed to, Lord, may my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so that's not prayer, that, that, that's magic. And Solomon says, no, no, that's the prayer of the witch. That's the witch's prayer. If I really think that prayer is all about manipulating God to somehow carry out what I want, get what I want, that's not prayer. That's magic. And Solomon calls it the witch's prayer. You see, when we pray, you notice many times we will add at the end of the prayer the, the, the phrase, in the name of Jesus Christ. So we'll, we'll pray our request, and we'll say, Lord, I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, what are we doing? What is that in the name of Jesus Christ? Is that a little magical incantation that you just kind of put that thing in there, add more syllables, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Boy, God goes, hey, hey, Gabriel, he said the magic words. Give him what he wants. That's not prayer. That's magic. And, and in the name of Jesus is not an incantation, a little magical formula to get your prayer through. Back in the days of Jesus, they had Pax Romana. That's called Roman peace. Before this time, we hear a lot of bad things about the Roman Empire. But before this time, you didn't travel outside your town. Because you went on a road outside your town, you're going to get killed. You're going to get, uh, uh, thieves are going to come upon you, and, and, and you're going to get ripped to shreds. So you pretty well stay close to home. Until the Romans basically established stradiate soldiers uh, along Roman roads to protect the roads so you could go from town to town, city to city. Well, that began to increase commerce, communication, and so you would send people from your town representing you in your name to request things from another town. And when they would show up, they would come in your name. Now, whatever you are asking, it better be what it is that you're being asked to ask. That is, whose ever name you're coming in. So if you come in, I come in the name of Joseph. And Joseph desires this. That is coming in the name, praying, requesting in the name of Joseph. So now when we come to the Heavenly Father, and we say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. What am I saying? Lord, what I'm about to ask you, is what Jesus would want me to ask you. Oh my. <laughs> Have you seen the new uh, 2015 Corvettes? Yeah. Really nice. You know, and in just about another month, you can get the 2014 and probably save 20 cents or, you know, whatever. <laughs> Lord, you know my heart. I've been good for a long time. I've been driving my little Mini Cooper at everybody else's ridiculing me. God, I pray in the name, name of Jesus for a new Corvette. Because I know this is exactly what Jesus would want me to pray for. Seems just doesn't seem to work. So first, prayer is commanded. Uh, prayer is basically not magic. It's not about God's way to get me to get what I want. But it seems to be something else. And what it is, it's mysterious. Thirdly, what, what do I mean that it's mysterious. Well, you know, the, the Apostle Paul, he understood unanswered prayer. 
And he didn't quit. He stayed an apostle. <laughs> you know, had his head chopped right off for the thing. Uh, I'm talking about 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The apostle Paul, he uh, 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 had this thorn in his flesh. Now, he, he wrote letters. He wrote books. Now, everybody gets real excited when you get a book published, right? Well, this guy not only got 13 of his books published, but he got them in the Bible. <laughs> that's really, that's better than the New York bestselling list, right? You got them in the Bible. And, and Paul realized that this would be a little heady thing, and apparently God realized that as well. So God permitted Paul to have a thorn in the flesh. And we're not sure what that was. Some say he had malaria, so he had eye problems, and that was a problem. Others say, no, every time he planted a church, these Judaizers would come and screw it all up, you know, and take it over. We don't know, but it was a real pain in the backside for Paul. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul says, I prayed three times. I asked God three times to remove it. Now, the fact he said he asked God three times to remove it, that meant, how did God respond to his first two prayers? Didn't happen. So Paul understands, he understands unanswered prayer. But he understood the teaching of Jesus. He persevered until he got it. Because he knew that the mystery of this has nothing to do with what he wants, but has to do with him discovering the mystery of what God actually wills and has a plan for his life. Most people were afraid of the will of God. I mean, you really believe God wants to break your legs, make you play the flute? You ladies think that God wants his will for your life is put your hair up in a bun, put you in Africa, and you'll never get married. I mean, people are scared to death of the will of God. That's why Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, now, I'm begging you that you offer your life a living sacrifice. Give your life a living sacrifice. Oh, that's living. A living sacrifice to God so that you might prove, prove what? He says, prove that the will of God is something good, perfect, and complete. Most people are Fearful of the will of God. God needs some PR going on down here. He needs some of his own that are willing to embrace the will of God with their life. Let the plan and the will of God work itself out in their life so people could see it's not that bad. Actually, it's good, perfect, complete, lacking nothing. So people would stop being so afraid of honoring their creator and living out the will of God. And see, that's what the whole point of prayer is all about. If you have your Bibles, uh, or look at what he says in 1 John chapter 5. This is one of John's last letters. And he writes this in chapter 5 to say why he writes 1 John. And he says, let me tell you why I wrote this, this letter, 1 John. And in chapter 5, verse 13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you might know that you have eternal life. The word there is uh, not gnosko, not come to learn, but the word oida in the Greek it means to know intuitively without any doubts. I've written this book so you can have some assurance and know that you've got a relationship with your creator through his son, Jesus Christ. You go, whoa, how, how, how could I have that kind of confidence? Well, in Bible study, when in doubt, what's a key thing to do? Read the next verse. Just a little brilliant scholar thing for you there. Verse 14, he says this. Now, this is the confidence. There's the word. This is the confidence that you actually have a relationship, eternal life, a relationship with God. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked. Now that's an interesting statement. He says, if I ask anything, anything I want, God hears my prayer, and when God hears my prayer, he answers my prayer. I get whatever I ask. That's how I have confidence I have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. Yeah, but well, there's a little fine, little, little catch there, isn't there? Hmm, did you see it? If I ask anything according to his... Oh, shoot. I don't think I'm going to get that vet. But again, our initial is why do we see that's a catch? Well, it's got to be according to the will of God. And, and who wants the will of God? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> now we've gotten to the issue. Who wants the will of God in their life? Who desires that God would implement so much that we would consistently, consistently be asking for God to work out his will and his plan for my life? Because that is the whole point. 
Do you like people taking you out of context? So ladies, you go out with some guy. Assuming you're single here. You go out with some guy. <laughs> and then you're talking to your friends. You say, well, how was the date? And you go, oh, his breath was horrible. He didn't shower. You know, the guy looked like he had pizza for a face. The guy was obnoxious. He was rude. I have to admit he had nice shoes. But other than that, I never want to see the guy again. Then your friend goes to, and I say, well, how did she like the date? Well, she really liked his shoes. Is there a problem here? Because I'm going to assume, well, if he really likes my shoes, then maybe I ought to go take her out again. You hate being taken out of context. But that's exactly what we do with the Scripture. Romans 8, 28. <laughs> for all things work together for good to those who love God are called according to His purpose. That's our visa uh, 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 verse. Right? God's going to work all things together. for Everything's going to be worked out good for me. Wait, wait, wait. That verse is in the middle of a paragraph. Why don't we look at the beginning of the paragraph, verse 26 of Romans 8. And here's what Paul says in context. In the same way, the Spirit helps our weakness. What, what, what weakness? We do not know how to pray as we ought to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, what does he mean, I don't know how to pray? Well, if I'm to pray according to the will of God... And God will hear any prayer that I pray according to the will of God. All I've got to do is always know the will of God. Now, how about you? I don't always know the will of God. So that's a real weakness. I don't know how to pray. You come to me and say, I've got this wart on my backside. Would you pray that God would remove it? I don't know. What if God wants you to have a wart on your backside so you sit less and run more? I don't know. So I don't always know what the will of God is. He says, but he helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts, that's God, he knows what we really, really want. He knows the mind of the Spirit. God the Father and the Holy Spirit have perfect communication. They don't have to go to communication conferences, all right? It says, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to the, guess what? The will of God. According to the will of God. That means, basically, when I pray, Spirit of God intercedes. And when my prayer is off the will of God, the Holy Spirit intercedes and conforms my prayer to the will of God. So God hears my prayer. And the promise of 1 John 5, He hears my prayer, the prayer is answered. Not no, wait, maybe, it's answered. Our problem is sometimes my prayer is so off the will of God that the Holy Spirit conforms it to the will of God. God answers the prayer. It comes right down to me and I don't even recognize it and I declare it unanswered prayer. Because I'm not praying at all. I'm in the magic. I'm in the witch's prayer. The witch's magic. And when I begin to understand, no, no, no. Prayer is mysterious. The whole issue here is for me to learn and learn to discover the will of God, the plan of God. Why? Why is that such a thing that God wants me to learn to be able to see what his plan and to see the world around me the way he sees it? Well, that's the fourth thing that I learned about prayer, and that's basically, it's my internship for the future. So what are you talking about, your internship for the future? Prayer is basically preparing and training us to be able to do what we're going to be doing in eternity. What does that have to do with sitting on the cloud and playing a harp? It has nothing to do with sitting on the cloud playing on a harp. What are we going to be doing for eternity? 2 Timothy chapter, 12, verse, chapter 2 verse 12 says, If we are faithful to Christ, he'll be faithful to us and we will reign with Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, why are you suing each other? You're shaming the name. Don't you know you shall reign with Christ because you'll rule over angels. You'll rule over nations. Revelation chapter 3, 21. You shall, Jesus says, you'll sit on my throne as I sit on my Father's throne. Revelation 5, 10. We shall be part of reigning with Christ. Now what do you think? When Jesus Christ returns and sets up his kingdom and we reign with Christ, we get little hats, we sit on a throne and play Monopoly? No, we're going to be reigning with Christ. Ruling with Christ, what does that mean? We will be implementing the will of God on in the kingdom. What was the Lord's prayer when the boy said, Lord, teach us how to pray? He says, well, when you pray, 
If you're Lutheran, pray this. But if not, pray like this. And he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then he said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is already in. That's what the ruling is all going to be. Implementing the very plan and the will of God into the next creation, whatever God decides to create. I mean, come on, he's eternal. Do you think he's going to stop creating? I, I think Revelation chapter 21 22 are the first two chapters of the next Bible. And as angels are involved in this creation, we're going to be involved in the next one. And we're going to be reigning with Christ, ruling with Christ. That means we're going to need to be viewing God's creation as God views it. And that basically boils down to two things. WW is what I call it. It's love. Love, it's simply recognizing the worth of God's creation, recognizing the worth of others and being concerned about their well-being. And when I realize that prayer is to begin to change my heart, so instead of always thinking about magic and what I want, me, myself, and I, the Blessed Trinity deal, all of a sudden I start praying and being concerned about recognizing the worth of others and being concerned about the well-being of others. Because when my heart becomes focused on that, I am now having the heart of Christ and I will be reigning with Christ and that's what I'll be involved in for the rest of my life. This is the internship of my future. So quickly, my practice of prayer, just really practically, my spiritual rhythm of prayer when I dance before the Lord in my life, just four things. One, I practice the presence of Christ. I practice the presence of Christ. The main word in Scripture in the New Testament for prayer is the word prosuke. Prasuke simply means to be conscious you are always in the presence of God. Always in the presence of God. Do you, do you not believe Psalm 139? He says, whether God knows what I'm going to say before I say it. He, he, he's all around me, surrounds me. I, I cannot escape his presence. I can't go anywhere on the earth and get away from God. I am always in the presence of God. And God does not like the silent treatment. If there's a relationship, there's a constant conversation. So for me, prayer is a constant conversation with God. I'm always talking to God. I'm talking to God right now because I see somebody looks like half asleep. God, wake him up. <laughs> I'm driving on the road. And I'm going, oh, Lord, you know, that person, oh, God, take him home. No, 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 that's not a good prayer. God, you know, uh, you know, why do I get so angry when people cut me off? And we're talking. God, whoa, we were at the beach. Whoa, Lord, you did some beautiful, beautiful creation on that lady. And thank you for my wife. I mean, the fact is that we're in constant conversation. And when it comes to sin, I start confessing sin before I do it. And so this is practicing the presence of Christ God is constantly engaged in my life. I don't wait for a prayer group. I don't wait to bow my head. I may crash into something. God and I, I am always conversing, always engaging, always asking questions, always asking for help. God, help me with this anger. I'm starting to get really mad here. Second of all, I practice instance in prayer. What do you mean I practice instance in prayer? I don't know. I just got tired of lying. Telling people I was going to pray for them and never did. And feel so guilty and think, oh, I gotta pray. What was that about? Oh, that's right, there's a wart on their backside. I, you know, I didn't know what to say. And so I've just decided that, that I don't wait anymore. If I am basically the heart of Christ is concerned about a person's well being, and somebody shares about something they're hurting, I'm concerned about their well being, you better not come and ask me to pray for you because we will do it right there in the middle of the freeway. We'll do it right there in the middle of the market, in my, the middle of wherever we're at. We'll do it right. We'll do whatever. I pray instantly. I don't wait for some prayer time. Thirdly, I practice corporate prayer, but. Big but there. That, that means I will pray with others. And it's good I, to pray with others. Um, but I'm cautious when I pray with others. The reason is because the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 6 he comes really hard on the, down on the Pharisees. He says, no, don't be like the Pharisees who stand on the big main street, let everybody know they're bobbing their head and doing their deal. He says, when you pray, go in the closet and pray alone with your father in secret. Well, that's supposed to be an intimate thing going on. But at the same time, in Acts, they gathered together and they prayed corporately together. But Jesus said, don't you think for a moment God's going to hear you because of your many words. The big but is this. When I pray with a group, I first listen. 
And if someone asks God for something I'm going to ask him for, I just add my amen. How many times you've been in a prayer group and you pour your heart out and you're aware somebody's sick and so you pray for them and you're your heart, pure heart, you pray to God for the sick person. And then the woman next to you, what does she do? She prays for the exact same thing, just like your prayer wasn't good enough. And I'm ready to bust chops here and we're in a prayer group. <laughs> prayer groups is not a competition on who can get it through. And if you're in a group and someone has prayed for something, don't insult God by go bidip, 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 and pray for the same thing eight times. Jesus said he'll not hear your many repetition of prayers like the Gentiles. There needs to be less praying in prayer groups, more listening, and more amens, and more respect to the one you're speaking to. Well, last of all, I practice being surprised. I, I, I just, like I said, God's infinite mind... <laughs> Because God is implementing his will in my life. So when I pray, and it looks like I didn't see an answer, then I, I know there was an answer. Spirit of God had to do some work on this prayer. And so I'm looking and watching what happened so I can learn and learn what it is the will of God and what God's plan is being unfolded. Like I said, like they used to say, you know, that movie, if you build it, they will come. The problem is Romans 8, 28, is if you pray, good will come. And what is the good? Remember, he'll work all things for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It's his will. But I also find that God surprises me with just gifts of grace. I don't know how it fits into his will. It's just gifts of grace. My, 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 my son, John, the elder, he's the smart one. He's a New Testament professor. And, and I, I look at my loins, I don't know where this kid came from. Holly said she was faithful to me 42 years ago. <laughs> but if she wasn't the milkman, brilliant. I don't know, Holly hates it when I say that. But anyway, the point being is this. This dear young man, he's a young man, he's 41, but he's, he's brilliant and he's just a humble, humble guy. And, and he, was, he, he, he fell last week and he tore open his foot. And, and I guess there's a... Uh, uh, something here that's that filleted open that holds all the metatarsal bones to get whatever. So he they take him to uh, 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 you know the ER and they're gonna, they want to do surgery. And so Tiff is what caused, says, well let's 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 get a second opinion. So they called us to pray and we we prayed. God just you know your will be done. This this guy he's got a lecture and you know Lord oh, I just hate to see him. my boy I hate to see him in such pain. So they go, they go to the head of the Sports uh, uh, Medicine Institute in Arizona that works with, with all the sports teams in Arizona. We actually do have sports teams in Arizona. Most people don't know that. They're not very good, but we, they hurt themselves a lot. And so this guy it works really hard on them. Well, John goes into this guy's appointment. He's the top doc. Uh, Johnson, Dr. Johnson Stein Dr. Johnson. And lo and behold... He grew up under my ministry at Scottsdale Bible Church as a kid. And you ready for this? He adores me. <laughs> Your dad is Dr. D. Oh, her. All that to say this, no surgery, and he's doing special care of my son. He's going to be in a cast for a while, but he gets the best doc in Arizona. That's, how does that fit into the will of God in my life, the plan of God? It doesn't. It's just God's grace. Every once in a while, God just gives the gift of grace. And so why do I pray? I'll tell you. I'll tell you why I'm never going to stop praying. It's an ongoing spiritual rhythm. It's dancing before the Lord. It's constant conversation. Constant conversation. Asking for wisdom here. For guidance there. For patience over here. God, for that well-being of that dear homeless person. It looks like they're in great pain. I can't get over there. I'm in the fast lane. But Lord, I can pray for their well-being I'm starting to kind of view my day kind of, I think, how Jesus views it. You know, I think I'm going to be ready when, when I go and be the kingdom with the Lord and I get to reign and implement God's will because I'll be having the very heart, the very thoughts, the very desires of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Like I said, prayer is not magic. Prayer is not God's way of giving me what I want. So don't set yourself up for disappointment, anger, and bitterness. Prayer is God's way. Of God giving us what he wants. And if you love the Heavenly Father and you want, love his will, 
you will find this constant conversation of prayer. You pray, good will come. You'll discover things you never discovered before. And he will guide you in the dance. He'll take the lead in the dance. Does this make sense? Then my closing prayer for this congregation is simply my benediction. And my benediction is simply this. Lord, may they say of us how they loved and made Jesus Christ known. It all comes down to that. God bless you. Darryl. Thank you, Daryl. So you got to come Wednesday night, hear about the heart, how important it is in the heart of the believers to change a, a, a troubled world into a world that knows about Jesus. So this Wednesday night, okay, 5.30 if you want to eat, the program starts at 6.30. And set aside September 6th for the marriage training in the afternoon with Pastor Kevin and Sherry. There's nothing more important in our life here and our culture than to address the issues about marriage and make them stronger and better examples of how Christ would have us live. So if you want prayer also, we're going to have folks up front that love to pray with you. Please come forward and share that with them. And then if you're new today, we're so glad you're here. We really, really are. Go outside. Go to the Connection Center to the left as you leave. They'll answer your questions. they got a special gift for you. We're so grateful to meet you. So go out and have a great day. We'll see you Wednesday night. God bless.